When you think of Embry-Riddle University, you generally see beaches, but there's a western branch you may not know about. Hi, I'm Tom Gresham. Welcome to Wings to Adventure. Out at that western location is a mile-high flying destination you're going to want to see. While we were there, we saw some great technology that'll make your flying safer. And we flew some hot home builds in front of the beautiful red rocks. We're heading west today, so buckle up. Brought to you by Optima Batteries, the ultimate power source. No matter how you get to historic Prescott, Arizona, it's worth the trip. It is history here. It's anchored by this grand courthouse and this beautiful plaza. It's framed by these majestic oaks. Alongside us is Whiskey Row, aptly named because at one time there were 27 bars lined up right here. But the truth of it is, Prescott is really about history, the West, and having fun. For pilots, the fun begins here, Ernest A. Love Field. The Prescott Airport is a wonderful mix of the small field we've all fallen in love with somewhere along the line, and the leading edge technology of one of the busiest flight training centers in the country. There's a classic retro airport diner. In the pale light of just dawn, you get the feeling you just might be sharing your coffee with a few timeless ghosts who've tossed their leather helmets, goggles, and scarves on the chair next to you as they sat down. And we found one of the sweetest little pilot shops you're ever gonna find anywhere. Look at this. <laughs> this, is our, this is our Quonset hut. I guess it is. It's a perfect place for a business like this, aviation related, because this reeks of aviation. Why? Built in 1942? At least, if not older. If not older. What made you want to have a pilot shop in the first place? Gives me an excuse to hang around airports, <laughs> which I've done since I was five years old. Airports and marinas. You're an airport kid, aren't you? I love it. All right. <laughs> and now it's my excuse to hang around here. It's my job. I have to. That's right. So it, it gives me a perfect reason to be here. Give me your impression of the Prescott Airport. It is a great airport to learn how to fly. It, you're a mile up. You get density altitude training. We get a lot of crosswind landings here you get a chance to do mountain flying. You won't get that along the coastlines necessarily. Certainly not the density altitude. Right. And I think as a result, people leave here more proficient at doing things they could rarely get in other airports. And that's why I tell people, this is a great place to come to learn how to fly. And while you're here, there's a lot of things that you can see and do that are, you've got the Grand Canyon of Sedona. Where else are you gonna find that? So it's a wonderful place to learn how to fly proficiently. And there's a lot of things to see and do around here too. Randy's got that right. From the Prescott Airport, you're a short flight from the ancient beauty of the Red Rocks of Sedona, or the Grand Canyon Airport, perched at a lofty 6,600 feet, just a stone's throw from the canyon's south rim. And flight training is big business. We quickly learned the programs at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University are only part of the Prescott story. Sky School is a flight school here at the Prescott Municipal Airport. It uh, came into origination in May of 2000 when the owner Dan Lawler bought out an existing flight school called Custom Pilot Service. Um, we love being on the Prescott Airport. It's a great place to fly. Arizona is a wonderful place for flying. You get probably 360 beautiful flight days a year. 
One program completely unique to the Sky School allows a student to work through all of his or her ratings, then sign on as a charter pilot for a sister company. The conduits concept at Sky School is kind of a unique thing that we're able to offer. Sky School, being a flight school, can give you your rating from private pilot to instrument, commercial, CFI, double I, MEI, we offer every rating available. Once we've trained you, it's likely that we will hire you if we've got an opening especially. Now you can build your time as an instructor and build your hours and now you hit the 500 mark and we can transition you as a pilot into Air Grand Canyon, flying charters and then flying air tours over the Grand Canyon. And we fly over to the Grand Canyon National Airport next. Then, we'll give you an advanced look at the new aircraft safety technology we'll all be carrying aboard our planes before long. All of that when Wings to Adventure returns. It's important to check your fuel to make sure you don't have any water in it. Of course, in the old days, we would sump our tanks, and when we're done, we'd just throw the gas out on the ramp. Well, a lot of airports won't let you do that anymore. Well, Sporties has come up with a very cool way to take care of that problem. They have a fuel tester with a strainer. And all you do is you, you get some fuel here. All right, well, we've got our fuel, and it looks like we have some water in the bottom of them. That's why we sump the tank. So what are you going to do with this gasoline? You can't throw it out on the ground anymore. Well, with using this Sporties tester, it's got a filter built into the top. Put this on top of it. And believe it or not, you just pour it back in the tank. And the really cool part is this filter catches the particulates, but it also prevents the water from going in there. If you've checked your fuel and you've met the EPA regulations, you're good to go. Just a short cross-country hop from Prescott, you'll find the Grand Canyon National Park Airport, where Sky School's sister company flies charters over the canyon. It's a gorgeous airport in a beautiful setting, but we learned from Air Grand Canyon pilot James Steele that there's a few things private pilots should know when flying here. Well, as a private pilot, um, some of the biggest problems probably is the uh, density altitude that they haven't experienced before. Uh, in the summertime, the numbers can reach about 12,000 feet. And of course, for a normally aspirated aircraft, that's quite a, a condition to fly through. Uh, the other thing is probably the airspace. Uh, they haven't seen uh, some of the special uh, flight rules that we fly in before. And so uh, it's a little confusing to them, to the two sides of the um, normal VFR chart that we use. Um, 
knowing where to enter the canyon, where to exit the, the Grand Canyon airspace, and um, basically reporting points um, that they're supposed to be using. But probably the biggest challenge would be that the weather, um, the winds that we experience, um, of course, are a little bit higher up than we are uh, typically. So um, they don't receive quite as much as the, of the mechanical mixing turbulence that we have. And don't let the remote setting fool you. This place can get way busy. Flying at the Grand Canyon, the National Park Airport here, we have quite a wide variety of aircraft. And in the summer, does it get busy? In the summertime, we're doing about six pilots a day, uh, flying seven or eight uh, tours around the canyon. So pretty much every hour of the day from eight o'clock in the morning to five o'clock in the evening, uh, we have a very congested airspace, um, both traffic inbound from the east and the west. It does get very, very congested, so, uh, Knowing your airspace and the radio procedures is a, a great benefit to flying into this airport. Hey, the whole idea is to see the canyon from the air. The best plan just might be to let Air Grand Canyon do the driving in one of their turbocharged Cesta 207 Skywagons. It's a view you don't want to miss. Next, it was back to our Prescott Airport base home of the western campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. When the Prescott, Arizona campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University was established as a sister site to the Daytona Beach facilities in 1978, only 200 students were enrolled. Now, that number is almost 1,700. Embry-Riddle as a whole produces 30% of all the aeronautical engineers in the nation. Standards are high. The fact of the matter is, you people are showing me you're pretty weak. Okay? This isn't rocket science. It isn't After all, these students are the future of the U.S. aerospace industry. Chancellor Dan Carroll is rightfully proud of Embry-Riddle Prescott. It's a beautiful campus, as I got a chance to see firsthand. I think our graduates uh, really uh, have done an outstanding job and leave here well prepared to, to function in, in virtually any area. We have uh, alumni really that, that have done virtually everything to do with aviation and aerospace. We have astronauts, uh, several that have flown on many missions. Uh, we have those that have gone on to fly with the carriers. In fact, uh, roughly one in four today of the pilots flying for the carriers uh, have some touch with Embry-Riddle. Uh, we have uh, those that have graduated from uh, engineering that are involved in management and, and design with all the major uh, aircraft corporations, Boeing, uh, Honeywell, uh, you name it, uh, they've all been involved with those programs. Our history is, is uh, really started in, in the flight arena and it's still a very big part of what we do. This particular campus started in 1978 with about 235 flight students and through the years we've continually added other degree programs such, such that today about 40 percent of our students on campus are involved in flight. So are we a flight school? In the sense that we train people for to be pilots, uh, I would say that's true. In the sense, though, that they have to complete all the other requirements for an educational degree, a bachelor of science degree, we're not a flight school in an FBO sense. Sean Geralds is director of flight operations for the 39 Embry-Riddle aircraft. On the people side, we train about 650 students that are in the aeronautical science program. And those are students getting a four-year degree in aeronautical science, and we provide the flight training piece of that. And that's provided by about 75 full-time flight instructors. Most of those folks are graduates. Uh, we also have some retired airline folks teaching for us. So graduates come out with a commercial multi-engine instrument. They can also get their CFI, their I, their MEI. And it's a multi-engine intensive flight course. 
Well, the one common thread with all the students we get here at Embry-Riddle is they are addicted to airplanes. They, they are called to be around flying machines. One piece of technology used for flight training at Embry-Riddle is likely to find its way into your cockpit and mine sooner than we think. We'll show it to you next. And we'll be high-flying in the high desert when Wings to Adventure returns. Wings to Adventure returns with a second visit to the campus of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, this time to take a look at the cutting-edge technology called ADSB, or Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. ADSB is being developed jointly by the FAA and industry, and the concept is simple. Aircraft will broadcast a message on a regular basis. The message will contain latitude, longitude, altitude, velocity, and possibly other information. All right, Sean, you said you have some pretty cool screens that you can look at from here on the ground and do some interesting tracking. Show me what you have. Well, we've got a software program that uh, records all the data. And for us, it's very valuable because we can come back and play back the actual flight in debrief. And it's kind of like having a black box on the ground. How has this changed anything the way you operate here? Um, it's made the debriefs much more accurate because a flight instructor can say, well, look, you actually, here's your 45 as you departed. Or actually, yeah, you, you, it was 90 degrees and actually show the student where they were at in relation to the downwind. And also on uh, incidents, the safety folks can sit down and play back and say, okay, what did you see? What did I see? And here's what really happened. Ah. And get to the root of what happened and why it happened. Sure. You know, and a lot of people are visual learners. They need to be able to see it here rather than trying to reconstruct it. And as we've always said, you know, an aircraft cockpit is a lousy classroom. Exactly. It's a lousy place to learn, but you can come back here and you can say, oh, that's what was going on. Exactly. I was overloaded at the time. I didn't see that. Now I get it. Clearly, the ADSB-based software has great flight training benefits, but we were anxious to see how it helps a pilot in flight. Embry-Riddle flight instructor Jared Testa gave us a real-world demonstration. This is our ADSB unit. We've got uh, traffic targets here, both C targets from Albuquerque Center, and our fellow ADSB equipped targets. 
got all the information we can use for him. It'll tell us our relative position by just looking at it and altitude relative to us along with a trend if they're climbing or descending. We can hit select, get some more information here on the box. It'll tell us their exact altitude difference, their exact distance, and the ground speed. Really handy, you'll see a traffic tar target pop up here and know exactly where to look out to supplement uh, for the traffic avoidance. Still, it doesn't, uh, doesn't keep you from the scene avoid, so it's just a nice tool to use. All right, helps you out a lot. As soon really as we have, have, I tell you, as soon as they have good coverage throughout the country, I want to put that in my plane. That is a fabulous tool. It would be a really great investment to put in your airplane. Not only does ADSB provide a wealth of useful information, so far there's good news about the cost. Right now, for the capability, it's relatively cheap. I want to say a, 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 a radio is around five thousand dollars, and this equipment. Uh, is between ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Oh, that's not bad considering what active TCAS has exactly. been costing. I mean, that's cheaper than that, and you're getting a whole lot more capability. According to Sean, the FAA plans to begin installation in 2007, starting with ground stations across the country where there are current radar sites. They plan for mandatory equipage of commercial and private aircraft within the next ten years. To me, it's, it's the, the most bang for the buck. It's, the, for, to me, the fastest, the prettiest, the best handling, easiest to fly airplane around. Brought to you by Optima Batteries, the ultimate power source. Look 
at that airport. On one of the prettiest little airports you'll ever drop into, Sedona, Arizona, we found a beautiful example of one of the jazziest airplanes ever spawned by the kit built movement. It belongs to airline instructor pilot Jim Thompson. Well, it's a Harman rocket built from uh, the kit. It was plans number 250 and was the 103rd Harman rocket to fly. The airplane weighs about 1,220 pounds, carries two people, 42 gallons of gas, and goes like a missile. A guy named John Harmon in California, been a friend of Vans up in Oregon, Vans Aircraft, for a lot of years. Uh, John built one of the first RV3s, and when the RV4 came out, John said, we can make it better, and began to design the Harmon rocket, and uh, created quite a machine out of, the, out of the airplane. Put it together, and they had it flying, from what I understand, less than 120 days. Jim's buddy, Warren Rice, a former Air Force pilot, joined him for some morning formation flying. Well, now, Jim, the big thing that makes a Harman rocket a rocket is this engine. Tell me about it's this. It's the thing. engine. Yeah. Like Omni 540, uh, this one was uh, off of a uh, Pitts S2B. It's an AEI 540. It's uh, modified with 9 to 1 compression, electronic ignition, and uh, is running 2,700 RPM at takeoff and, and developing probably 300 horsepower. And top speed on this? Top speed, uh, 260 knots. 260 knots. That's top speed. That's the red line. Going straight down? Nope. <laughs> Just slightly down. Oh, okay. Two or three degrees down okay. and it'll go. Now this is all your creation, right? Well, pretty much, yeah. How long did um, it take you to build this? This is a seven year project. Well, I see what you mean about the stretch. This is roomier. It's a lot more roomy than the RV4 is. The right. back seat is the same width, but the instrument panel has a 32 inch wide panel on it. Okay. So you've got volumes of room up in the front. So and it's very, very comfortable. Now, what do you have in your panel there? Basic VFR stuff. I've just got a compass, turn and slip. I've got a GPS comm, right. and it's day-night uh, day VFR only. I use uh, the GPS and the map and go wherever I want to go. This is a gorgeous plane. Man. Thank you. I can Thank see you. why you love it. No, I love it. I do. Super. I love it. The truth is, I lived in Prescott many years ago, and I've always wanted to come back. Well, this was a worthwhile trip. In fact, it's so good, I'm going to come back again. Maybe I'll see you here. For Wings to Adventure, I'm Tom Gresham. Fly safe.